I'd like to introduce you to Steve Rogers. Steve uh, went to Oshkosh and other places on a tour uh, by Tory Tours. I've never been one to be serious about tours. Um, I didn't think that I would ever enjoy myself on one of those. But uh, I've been talking to Steve since he got back. I've seen his photos, I've seen his movies, and I've seen his diary. And he did everything you could ever possibly do or want to do uh, to go and see the, the aviation places in USA. Um, and so I thought it was such a good roundup in talking to him that he should come along and talk about Tory tours and the tour that he had. Hmm? Would you like to come forward, Steve? Absolutely. Yeah, right. um, First of all, I'll put on the Tory tours cap. <laughs> Steve has no financial interest in this, he'd just like to, <laughs> to tell you what went on. Um, but he'll also tell you that Tory are organising a, a tour to Wanaka in New, in, uh, New Zealand uh, in the near future. And uh, if anyone's interested in going there, they should possibly think seriously about this after you hear from Steve. So over to you, Steve. I'll have to get through in 15 minutes, so first of all, I'm going to hand over the bell to Brian. And he's got a watch. Got the watch. Got Does the big work? black watch. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hope some of you will find this a bit interesting. For me, it was just a blast. 21 days of the best fun. Uh, 39 guys, uh, all with a passion for aviation. Uh, we had people ranging from a 737 captain, chair captain, glider pilots, commercial and private pilots, glider um, those who had no interest in aviation, apart from the fact they liked those things with, you know, silver things with things out the, out the side. But where to start? Well, I um, read in a, an Australian magazine that uh, Tory Tours was doing such a tour to the USA, including Oshkosh. Rather timid of the reaction I'd get from my wife, I prefaced my remarks to along the lines of, would you like to go to the USA for 21 days? We're going to drive through and fly over 21 states, 25 states and uh, have a ball. She said, of course. And then I said, well, there's one catch. We're going to be going to 10 aviation museums <laughs> and half a dozen uh, airfields. And well, that's when she got, I got the reaction I expected. So I, I was <laughs> on, my, on my way. Um, but I knew nothing about Tori. Um, so I rang them and they were kind enough to give Mr. Les Auger's name to me. Les had been with them before. And, uh, and he vouchsafed for their uh, authenticity. I contacted them, paid the deposit, and made the arrangements, which were to pay for EAA membership, that was about $110, pay, and that granted you a cheaper <coughs> weekly adult membership into the air show itself, which was about 40 bucks. You go online, and the Americans have got a wonderful thing called SD, STA, that you can apply for your visa waiver. <coughs> Be careful though, the official one costs you $14, the privateers who do the same thing out there on the internet can come in at 100 plus. I flew to Sydney, went out by there, but the flights to America were organised through Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. They went to San Francisco, a lot of people going to Oshkosh, coming through Dallas, San Francisco <laughs> or LA. We then, to the same day, caught a flight to Seattle and that's where we all congregated after getting our heads around the time difference uh, we then headed out to um, do Seattle and if ever you want one place on this God's earth to do aviation it's got to be Seattle there's the uh, Boeing factory for a start uh, which is uh, one of the highlights and in fact it wasn't a factory per se what we saw was the uh, assembly area where they bring in all the parts from all around the world Interestingly, that very week that we were there, American Airlines announced that they were breaking from Boeing and going to bring in Airbus into the equation. In fact, they were giving all their future orders, massive order, billions and billions of dollars worth of business, and that created such a stink that they relented and then divided up the two, which is a clever ploy, because you've got two suppliers vying for the business, it's always going to be better for you, isn't it? So at the Boeing uh, factory, you, you get a, a handle on things and you, you, you uh, come back and they flog their Boeing equipment, uh, Boeing um, paraphernalia, 
we also, and I must refer to my notes because after 21 days of 10 museums, everything's blurring into, into one. At uh, Seattle, there's a um, private museum uh, that's owned by Paul Allen. Paul Allen, for those of you who do not know, is a uh, co-founder of Microsoft. He's poured a lot of money into collecting some of the most amazing and unique aircraft in the world and doing them up. When you get, you've got his sort of money, you don't have to worry about where the dollars are coming from. For instance, he spent $25 million in the Spaceship One project to get a private aircraft, private article carrying people up into space and won the $10 million prize. That's an equation that doesn't make sense to me, but there you go. Um, so you, at, at that, um, at that uh, fantastic place, you, you, get, you get a sense of where the Americans uh, excel, and that is to put on a good show. We did the Kenmore seaplane flight. That's uh, over all the wonderful waterways in, um, in Seattle, and they have lots of those. We get a touch and go in a turbine powered otter. I was co pilot that day while I sat where the co pilot was set. And I found out that um, with seaplanes, there's no such thing as a crosswind landing. You can land into the, wing most, into the wind most times with a seaplane. Uh, the Museum of Flight, there is the Gossamer Albatross. This is the craft that uh, a human being amazingly pedalled across the channel in. It weighs next to nothing. A replica Wright Flyer, SR Blackbird, uh, 71 Blackbird, and a MiG-15 that, that in the Korean War was flown into an American base by a Korean pilot who was defecting. He didn't know, and I believe this is the truth, that uh, there was a $100,000 prize to a North Korean pilot who brought such craft into an American base. He came unannounced. How he wasn't shot down is uh, a mystery. Uh, and and the, the, the aircraft uh, that, that are there in that museum are just uh, staggering. We then flew direct to New York, so uh, Seattle to New York is a fair distance right across the country. Little did we know that, uh, well, Seattle has an equitable climate, but we were heading into a hellhole. That week we were in New York was the hottest America has experienced in that part of the country for 100 years. And I'll tell you, it was 107 Fahrenheit in the bus. Not outside, in the, in the bus. And we were in a, um, a traffic jam that went back through the city for, you know, probably into the next county. It was uh, got awful. But New York itself, uh, in, a, in good weather, would have been great. Went to the top of the Rockefeller Center and, and saw over the skyline. They don't want to talk about the Twin Towers there, so you don't actually get to, to go to that site, unfortunately. We did the Harbour Cruise, saw where uh, Solly Sonnenberger landed the aircraft in the Hudson, mm. on the Miracle on the Hudson. We went to the aircraft carrier Intrepid, which is a World War II uh, iconic aircraft carrier. Nowadays, it's a museum. It was destined for the scrapyard, the Fisher family, and this is a story that's just unbelievable. This guy came in as an immigrant to America, made it a really big time in real estate in New York. In the Second World War, he was uh, uh, not eligible for, um, for joining up because of physical disabilities, but repaid his love for America but in later years by uh, giving an enorm enormous amount of money to particularly the victims or the families of the victims of American atrocities, you know, when uh, servicemen died overseas. But he also, the, fa the family rescued the intrepid from the scrap heap and turned it into a uh, educational machi um, facility. Old Ra Rhinebeck Air Airfield, I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but I certainly hadn't. But it's up the Hudson River Valley. Uh, again, another uh, example of someone who just got off their bum and did something. In this case, it was a, a Cole Palin, no rel relative to Sarah, I think. <laughs> and his passion was to res re preserve early examples of uh, aircraft. We're talking from 1910, but all these aircraft are flyable, and that's the difference. And they do fly them, or they hop them up the runway for you to see that they do actually fly. And they take off remarkably early on, a couple of feet rolling on and they're off. Uh, so it was a day of uh, fun, but the Australians were attacked by a lot of Americans who wanted to show their grandchildren the way that we speak. <laughs> so we were frequently taken over to the side and said, you know, will you say something to my grandson? <laughs> I, I, I 
I also wanted to know the Americans' attitude to guns, which I just don't get. And I've never found, and I raised the question many, many times, one American who doesn't think it's a good idea to carry. We, <laughs> and uh, then we went uh, by bus down to Philadelphia, the cradle of American legislature, law and banking. Who would, and, and why did um, Philadelphia lose its position as number one on the Eastern Seaboard? Can anyone ask me that? And to, compared to, say, New York? Very simply, it's got a freshwater harbour that throws up in winter. New York's got a saltwater harbour. It didn't. Such is life. We finished up at Washington, D.C., and if ever I went back to America, and I will have to with my wife as payback, I think, uh, that's where we've been heading. It's just a simply gorgeous place, and at every street corner there's a Smithsonian museum of something. Um, the building at the architecture is just wonderful. Never seen so many Gothic columns in my life. The iconic um, things like the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Memorial, White House, of course, uh, they're all within walking distance. This is something I didn't realise. You can actually spend a good day walking around to all these things. But at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, you'll find the original Spirit of St. Louis, Mercury Friendship 7, Apollo 11, um, something that a lot of people didn't know. We know that Neil Armstrong was the first person to walk on the moon. But I want you to look carefully at Buzz Aldrin when, he's, uh, when he was snapped by Neil on the ladder leading down because he was the second man on the moon and he's got a stance like this. So the uh, foot's on the ladder, the other one's out like that. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what he's doing? <laughs> he's the first man to have a pee on the moon. <laughs> he tried to hold off, but he, they've been in those spaces, space shoots a long time. And uh, he was saying, for God's sake, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they said, you know, frizzle all the electronics. Don't do it. <laughs> to hell with that, he had to. Um, so the, I had, up to that point, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, I would rate above that of uh, Seattle, and that's what you would expect, but better was to come. We flew to Chicago. And uh, then it's a, it's a beautiful drive, maybe about three hours, uh, Chicago on the Great Lakes, up, up to the western side of the Great Lakes to Oshkosh. And um, at Oshkosh, uh, the tour had, group had been um, billeted into Scott Hall, which uh, is in the University of Wisconsin there on summer break, of course. All the accommodation in that university is taken up by Oshkosh attendees. 7,000 people in the week will attend. It's quite amazing. The, um, uh, where you have a meal is called Blackhawk Commons, seats 2,000 at a time. The meals are incredibly inexpensive, $8 for breakfast and everything you can eat. I, I went up to the counter and the woman said to me, what will you have? And I said, half of what he's having. <laughs> I mean, they know how to tuck in. Um, so we had the accommodation, it's bare basic, no air conditioning. Uh, the, you know, you're encouraged to buy fans, leave them there when you leave, they auction them off and make money, but um, it, it's, it's quite, it's not uncomfortable, believe you me, and there's probably more space than a lot of hotel rooms. They have ethernet, they have uh, wireless, and, and um, that's covered. So we had uh, a bus right outside for $1.50, you get the 10 kilometer trip to the airfield, uh, they leave every time it's hit full, which is about every 10 minutes, so it's going back and forth all day. Uh, it's a no-brainer. It's a, it's a lovely stop. We got there on the Wednesday, uh, uh, settled in and, and just recovered, and then went out on the Thursday, Friday and Saturday. I fully intended to go to the air show on Saturday night. 40 hours in total, being on your feet, I was stuffed. What you do need to do, do when you go to Oshkosh, sunscreen, lip lock, a hat, long sleeves, long trousers, um, and water like you wouldn't believe because it, it is warm and there's a lot of walking. And realise you cannot do everything. Brian will explain all the choices available to you, but if you take two out of possible seven things you could do and do it well, it's fine. What was amazing to me was there is uh, something like uh, six active runways at Oshkosh. The place just, how people don't bump into each other, God only knows. Helicopters are taking off with a ceiling of 300 feet. The Ford tri-motor is going back and forth. 
aircraft are coming and departing. They've got the air show happening over there with jets screaming around and God all, and knows what else. And to cap it off, they've also got a seaplane area on Lake Winnebago. So, uh, you know, you do the maths. 10,000 aircraft uh, attend. Most of them arrive, of course, before the air show. A lot of people sleep under the wings. It's just, it's just truly staggering. Uh, it's hard not to walk around with your mouth open all the time in wonderment. But if you like new aircraft and like kicking tyres, if you like home builds, it's all there. Uh, from Oshkosh we drove down to Dayton by Indianapolis through some of the best countryside that uh, you will ever witness. Dayton was the National Museum of the Air Force at the Wright-Patterson Air Base. Just, just staggering in the, the amount of stuff that they had there. Retired Presidential Air Force Ones, military aircraft, uh, box car which dropped the Nagasaki bomb, Vietnam helicopters, missiles and so on. Uh, nearby is Huffman Prairie where the um, Wright brothers did their thing. And um, you remember they came from Kitty Hawk after, after testing the previous year with a glider. So they had got the principles right but they still hadn't got to a stage where they had powered controllable flight and that's where that was accomplished. They also didn't have the wind of Kitty Hawk, so they worked out that if they had a damn big heavy weight on a pulley system that thrust them into the air with that low powered aircraft, they could um, repeatedly get into the air and practice. They were one of the world's first um, test pilots, flight instructors, thank you. Um, and um, so they perfected their art out there. When they realized they'd got it, I mean, little things like they painted the metal in their engine black. Why? They hadn't a patent that covered aluminium parts used in aircraft engines. So they were pretty crafty, but they got it all together. They then disappeared off the scene for a year, got all the paints in place, and the rest is history. We went to the Dayton Engineers Club, which is just amazing. I mean, Dayton in that time um, had more patents per head of population than anywhere on earth. And uh, you could look at the history of the Dayton Engineers and see what modern appliances we use today that came from there. The ring top off your Coke can, for instance. Um, we flew to Dallas and then on to Tucson. Tucson, famous for the Boneyard or the Davis Minor. Monfan Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group. Did you know if those aircraft, which are 4,400 aircraft spread over 11 square kilometres, were considered an air force, that would be the second biggest air force in the world. These planes are not destined for, most of them are not destined for scrap. I don't know why I call it a scrap yard, it's just a used car lot because they will go on for sale for elsewhere. They've got a wonderful little, you, you drive down in the bus, down these rows, and they have the examples of all the aircraft there. And on one site, there were just three wheels. That was a stealth fighter. <laughs> <laughs> um, security is extremely tight and that's from that um, site. For every dollar they spend there, they recover $11, so it's a very profitable operation for them. Nearby is the Pima Air and Space Museum. Um, again, a lot of these aircraft are parked out in the open. Why did they choose that particular part of the country? Low rainfall, low humidity, high elevation, alkaline soil, and they don't have to bring, build runways because the soil is really as hard as concrete, so they just fly them in. So you'll find every big plane to make your heart happy, B-36s, Super Guppies, Douglas Invaders, etc, etc there. They then take you onto the Type 2 missile site. Uh, here's an example of stupidity, if you will. So you re realize that Russia and America facing off against each other, um, ready to annihilate themselves and every human being on Earth in one terrible catastrophe. But um, they, they never thought through the fact that the guys were safe underground through, you know, that 700 tonnes of concrete above them. It was all sprung loaded so they didn't bounce around too much when the bombs went up above. But um, so they survived the nuclear holocaust and they sent off their missiles and they had nuked all the Russians. Great. But what happens when they come back to the surface to find their families and children? Would you want to come back to that scenario? I certainly wouldn't. So I'm glad that era in our history is uh, long gone. 
Uh, then we drove, again, this is tremendously hot. This is 45 degrees centigrade days. Every afternoon, they call it in that part of the country, the monsoon, these dry lightning storms come through and it's spectacular. But we got to Phoenix, um, where we uh, from Scottsdale, which got a, the most fantastic um, air training facility uh, that you can imagine. Beautiful buildings and aircraft. And we went by Cessna Grand Caravan up to the Grand Canyon. Unfortunately, that day that we went, um, a German tourist got killed by lightning. So you better take care <laughs> when it starts to thunder, you, you, you find shelter. And the previous week, four people fell to their death Jeez, I mean, the, the, the Grand Canyon, there's no safety fences. It's, you know, take personal responsibility, please, and, and um, don't go too near the edge. I think that's the message. From the Grand Canyon, we uh, then, through Phoenix, went back to San Francisco, back to Sydney, and battled a 300 knot headwind back to Perth, which we landed in, and I took a week to recover. So that's my story, folks. I hope you got something out of it. I certainly did. The, um, the guys in EAAA do up a magazine as part of your subscription, uh, one, one a month, which comes in the mail, it's fantastic, it's on the internet as well. And uh, Flying Back in Time is a recent uh, article uh, about what New Zealand's doing with replica um, aircraft, and that leads me into the wings over Wanaka, which Torrey tours, again, I've got no interest in this, so you can do it or you don't, I couldn't care. but. The information is available now on their uh, 2012 program into New Zealand, which uh, if anyone's interested, I'll point them in the right direction. So thank you for your patience. You have a question, How many on your tour? 39. All in the same bus? Yes. Uh, oldest age, 85. Youngest, 25. So 60 years gap. 60 years is also, incidentally, the time between when the Wrights flew their first aircraft till the man landed on the moon. The prices they quoted for that tour, whatever it was a couple yep. months ago, was there any other government charges and extras over and above that price? None. There were no airport uh, fees. There is a, sorry, there was one. There was the, the, um, the bag fee. American Airlines, United Airlines charge $25 for the first bag and goes up and up, but for God's sake don't get over it because one guy I saw was three pound over and was charged $100. Um, if, if you saw what I saw, which is anything that doesn't go in your bag goes on the aircraft and it's getting quite ridiculous now. I wouldn't like to get, try and get off an aircraft in America in an emergency because you never make it. Everyone brings everything on board and it's allowed. It's just Thank you Steve for that uh, illuminating talk and um, you can tell I'm sure that he had a good time.